Twilight over meadow and water, the eve star shining above the hill, and old Nog the heron crying, cropping up the sere reeds of the riverside, for the owl had flown from under the middle arch of the stone bridge. Voles were at work, clearing their tunnels, scraping new shafts and galleries, biting the rootlets which hindered them. An otter, curled in the dry upper hollow of a fallen oak, heard them, and, uncurling, shook herself on four short legs. Through a woodpecker's hole above her she saw the star cluster of the hunting dogs as faint points of light. She was hungry. Since noon the otter had lain there, sometimes twitching in sleep. The white owl alighted on the upright branch of the tree, and the otter heard the scratch of its talons as they gripped the bark. The otter gave but a glance to the bird. She was using all her senses to find enemies. She stood rigid. The hair on her back was raised. Mingled with the flower odours which were unpleasant to her was the taint that had given her a sudden shock. The taint most dreaded by the otters who wandered and hunted and played in the country of the two rivers. The scent of deadlock. The great pied hound with the belving tongue, leader of the pack whose kills were notched on many hunting poles. The otter had been hunted that morning. Deadlock had chopped at her pate, and his teeth had grooved a mark in her fur as she ran over a stony shallow. The pack had been whipped off when the master had seen that she was heavy with young, and she had swum away down the river and hidden in the hollow of the water-lapped trunk. The mist moved down with the river. Her heart slowed. She forgot quickly. She put her head and shoulders under water, holding her breath, and steadying herself by pressing her tail, which was thick and strong, and tapered from where her backbone ended, against the rough bark. She was listening and watching for fish. Swimming above the weeds of the pool, she followed the way of the trout, searching every big boulder. She found a fish under an ash tree root, and as it tried to dart away over her head, she threw herself sideways and backwards and seized it in her teeth. By a bay in the bank, broken and beaten by the hooves of cattle going to drink, she ate her prey, holding it in her forepaws and crunching with her head on one side. She was drinking a draught of water when a whistling cry came from under Canal Bridge. It had a thin, hard, musical quality and carried far down the river. She answered gladly, for it was the call of the dog otter with whom she had mated nearly nine weeks before. He had followed her down from the weir by the scent lying in her seals or footprints, left on many scars and on the otter path across the meadowland of the river's bend. He swam in the deep water, hidden except for his nose, which pushed a ream on the surface, placid in the windless night. He was kicking four webs together, having sighted a fish. The peel, or sea trout, had gone down, passing three inches off the snapped jaws. Where water clawed the stones at the tail of the pool, the peel leapt to save itself from the enemy, ever trudging and peering behind it. It fell on the shillets on its side and flapped once, then lay still, moving only its gills. Then the dog otter was standing by it, holding up his nose to sniff the air, when a thin, wavy, snarling cry rose out of the water. It was the bitch's yinny yicka, or threat. She ran upon the fish, pulled it away from the dog, who was not hungry, and started to eat. The dog had caught and eaten a peel on his journey and was ready for sport and play, but the bitch didn't follow him into the river. She felt the stir of her young, snarled at the dog in sudden fear and turned away from the water. The moon rose up two hours before dawn, and the shaken light on the waters gladdened her, for she was young, and, calling to the dog with a soft, flute-like whistle, she swam to the high-arched bridge upriver and hid among the sticks and branches posited by the flood on the bow of the stone cutwater. Here he found her, and they played for half an hour, turning on their backs with sideways sweeps of rudders and never touching, although their noses at each swirling encounter were but a few inches apart. It was an old game they played, and it gave them delight and made them hungry. So they went hunting for frogs and eels in a ditch which drained the water meadows. 
The rising sun silvered the mist lying low and dense on the meadow, where cattle stood on unseen legs. Over the mist the white owl was flying on broad, soft wings. It wafted itself along, light as the mist. Throughout the daylight it stood among the bones and skulls of mice. At dimity it flew down the right bank of the river and perched on the same branch of the fallen oak and scurred to its mate, who roosted by day in a barn near the village. It flew away. It fluttered down upon many mice in the fields, but the bitch otter did not leave her hold. The instincts which had served her life so far were consumed in a strange and remote feeling that smouldered in her eyes. She lay on her side in pain and a little scared. When the moon gleamed out of the clouds in the east, pale and wasted as a bird in snow, the occasional whistles of the dog ceased. She didn't care, for now she needed no comfort. She listened for another cry, feeble and mewing, and whenever she heard it she rounded her neck to caress with her tongue a head smaller than one of her own paws. All the next day and night and the day after she lay curled for the warming of three blind cubs. And while the sunset was still over the hill, she slid into the water and roved along the left bank, looking in front and above her, now left, now right, now left again. A glint in the darkness. Her back looped as the hind legs were drawn under the full thrust of webs, and bubbles wriggled off her back, larger than oak apples. She was only a little slower than when she had last chased a trout. Her rudder, about two-thirds as long as her body and two inches thick at the base, gave her such power of swiftness in turning that she snatched the fish two feet above as it flashed over her head. She ate it ravenously, half standing in shallow water, yinnying at shadows as she clawed and swallowed. After four hasty laps, she went under again. She caught an eel, ate the lower part of it, and returned to the holt. But she was still hungry and left them a second time, running up the bank to stand upright with the breeze drawing across her nostrils. The eldest and biggest of the litter was a dog cub, and when he drew his first breath he was less than five inches long from his nose to where his wee tail joined his backbone. His fur was soft and grey as the buds of the willow before they open at Easter tide. He was called Taka, which was the name given to otters many years ago by men dwelling in hut circles on the moor. It means little water wanderer, or wandering as water. This was the bitch's first litter, and she was overjoyed when Taka's lids ungummed and his eyes peeped upon her, blue and wondering. He was then eleven days old. When his eyes had been opened a fortnight, Taka knew so much that he could crawl as far as a yard from her and stay away, although in her anxiety she mewed to him to return. She was afraid of the daylight by the opening of the holt, but Taka had no fear. He went back to his mother and played the biting game with her, after which he slept. When he awoke again, he saw one of his sisters playing with something and immediately wanted it. The cub was patting it with one paw, holding her head sideways, but as it did not run, she patted it with the other paw, while holding her head to that side. Taka was slowly crawling towards it, meaning to take it for himself, when he noticed that it was looking at him. The look frightened him, as he tissed at it. When next he went towards it, the look in its eyes had changed, and he boldly touched it with his nose and shifted it with a paw. It looked at him no longer, for it was only the skull of a field vole, and light coming down a woodpecker's hole from above had put shadows into its empty eyes. Taka moved it between his paws. Some of its teeth dropped out and rattled inside the hollow. The sound pleased him. He played with the skull, when he heard one of his sisters mewing in hunger, he hurried back to his mother. One evening, when the cubs were alone, Taka was playing with his rattle when he heard for the first time the jets and rills on the stones which made the ancient song of the river. He wanted to get nearer to the sounds and crawled along a route. When he was halfway along it, he saw that there was nothing on either side of him. He was alone on the route. He tried to turn back, but the claws of one hind foot slipped and there he clung, curved across the wood, unable to go up or down. 
He mewed to his mother, but she didn't come. His cries grew more and more plaintive as he became colder. The bitch had heard Tarka's cries, and fear had shocked her into the swiftest movements. She picked up her cub by the neck and carried him to the shore. She swam with her head held high and carefully, lest the water should touch him. Afterwards, lying on the warm couch, she forgot her fright and closed her eyes in the enjoyment of her young. The next night, Tarka crept along the route again and fell in the same way. He was crawling around when a strange-smelling animal leaned over him, wetting him with drops from its jowl. He tissed at it and tissed again when he heard the yinny yicker of his mother and the snap of her teeth as the animal was driven away. Then something bit the back of his neck and lifted him up. With the cub dangling from her mouth, the bitch threatened the dog otter, who had followed her in curiosity to the holt. The dog tried to look into the tree on the following night, but the bitch dragged him down by the rudder, as though she would drown him. The dog thought this was fun, and regrousted with her under and on the water, all the way to Leaning Willow Island, where she left him, remembering Tarka. In mid-May, the buds of the fallen oak began to open, hopefully, and to show their ruddy leaves. The cubs were two months old, and they'd learned to squeeze through the inner opening of the holt and run along the route in order to play on the grassy bank. One night, as they were playing rough and tumble round the base of an ash tree, they heard their mother's whistle. The bitch was waiting for them. She had brought an eel, which she bit into pieces beginning near the tail, but leaving the head above the paired fins. Tarka swallowed little pieces of the fish and licked his small sister's head afterwards because it tasted nice. Then he licked his own paws. He was cleaning himself for the first time. After their mother's milk, the new food changed them almost at once. They grew swift and fierce. Their frolics on the bank often ceased at the cry of a night bird or the distant bark of a cattle dog in the village. They started whenever their mother started. They began to fear. One warm evening, when the river was low, the mother swam down to the holt and called the cubs into the water, and although they were ravening, she didn't climb up, but waited for them with a fish below the tree. Tarka watched her. He wanted the fish, but he dared not let go with his feet. The fish came no nearer, so he dropped down into the black, star-shivery water. He was clutched in a cold and terrible embrace, so that he could neither see nor breathe, and although he tried to walk, it smothered him, choked him, roared in his ears, and stifled every mew for help, until his mother swam under him, pressing pads and tail against her back. Tarka was carried to the stony margin of an islet, where the closed flowers of the water crow's foot were floating among their leaves. He spluttered and sneezed and shook water out of his eyes, and saw the stars above him, and felt his mother's tongue on his head. When he had eaten the fish, Tarka began to enjoy the strangeness. He was playing with the fish tail when he heard the whistle so often listened to from the holt. When he saw the animal with the wide, flat head and great bristling whiskers that had loomed over his head once before, Tarka tissed and snarled at it and ran for his mother. He snapped at the nose, sniffing at him. The dog turned on his back and tried to touch Tarka with his paws in play. Tarka watched him and wanted to roll as well, but he was awed by the stranger's size. When he went into the water the next night and tried to walk towards his mother, he floated. He was so pleased that he set out across the river by himself, finding that he could turn easily towards his mother by swinging his hindquarters and rudder. He turned and turned many times in his happiness. East towards Willow Island and the Water Song, west towards the Kingfisher's Nest and Peel Rock below Canal Bridge and the Otter Path crossing the Big Bend, north again and then southwest, where the gales came from, up and down, backwards and forwards, sometimes swallowing water, at other times sniffing it up his nose, sneezing, spitting, coughing, but always swimming. He learned to hold his nose above the ream or ripple pushed in front of it. When they had been swimming about a fortnight, the bitch took her cubs to a pool below the bridge and walked with them across a shallow tail of water. While they were watching, the mother ran along the bank to the top of the pool and slid into the water. 
More often than usual, her head looked up as she swam from bank to bank, for she was not hunting, but driving the fish down to the cubs. Taka became excited, and seeing a fish, he swam after it and went underwater to get it. In order to travel faster, he struck out with all four webs together, and lo, Taka was swimming like an otter near a fish. It was the biggest fish he had ever seen, and although he kicked after it at a rate of nearly two hundred kicks a minute, he lost it after a yard. He yickered in his anger, and oh, Taka was no longer swimming like an otter, but gasping and coughing on the surface, a poor little sick-feeling cub mewing for his mother. Later in the holt, Taka closed his eyes, breathed deeply, and settled to sleep on the youngest cub's neck. He looked up when his mother ran to the opening. The otter was listening to a sound like the high, thin twang of a mosquito. Hair bristled on her neck. From far away there came a deep rolling sound and a screaming cheer. The otter instantly returned to her cubs and stood over them in a protective attitude, for she knew that hounds were hunting the water. The cries were growing louder. Taka heard thuds in the wood all around him. The cubs crouched in the darkest corner. By their big feet, hounds pulled themselves out of the water, except the one who threw his deep tongue at the holt opening. He was all black and white, with great flues and the biggest stallion hound in the pack. He was black from nose to neck, except for the pallid nicks of old quarrel scars on his muzzle and head. No hound quarrelled with him now, for Deadlock was master of all. In his veins ran the blood of the Talbots, and one of his bloodhound ancestors had eaten man. Deadlock was the truest marking hound in the country of the two rivers. He held by his paws, and his teeth tore at the sodden tinderwood. He could thrust in only his head. While he was kicking the water for a foothold, the otter ran forward and bit him through the ear, piercing the earmark where the blue initial letters of his original pack were tattooed. Deadlock yard through his bared teeth. Three small mouths at the other end of the holt opened and tissed in immense fright. Then Tarka heard a cry which he was to hear often in his wanderings, a cry which to many otters of the two rivers had meant the longest swimmings, the fastest land looping, the quietest slipping from drain or holt were unavailing. Tally ho! The cry came from down the river, just above Leaning Willow Island, from the throat of an old man in a blue coat and white breeches, who had been leaning his bearded chin on his hands, clasping a ground ash pole nearly as long and as old as himself. From his lookout place he had seen something moving down, like brown thongweed, just under the clear and shallow water. Off came the hat, grey as lichen, to be held while he cried again, Tally ho! Here, across the shallow, a dozen men and women stood almost leg to leg in the water, stirring the stream with their iron-shod poles to stop the dog-otter passing down to the next pool. A dozen hounds were giving tongue between Canal Bridge and the stickle above Leaning Willow Island. A shaggy face looked into the holt, and a voice cried just over Targa's head, Go on, leave it, dewdrop! Go on, leave it! Boots knocked on the trunk. Is 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 Go on, leave it! and Dewdrop left it, bitten in the nose. Unable to break the stickle, the dog otter went back under the bridge. Baying became fainter. The notes of the coal tits in the ash tree were heard again. The sound slowed and ceased, except for the lone baying of a hound. They broke out again and slowed away into silence. But long afterwards, the strange blowing noises made by their mother frightened the huddled cubs. By and by they fell into a deep sleep, torn with dreams wherein an immense black face showed its long fangs. Tarka slept with his small paws on the neck of his mother, and her paw held him there. She awoke when the wood owl had made a score of journeys with mice to the nestlings in the old eyrie of a trapped buzzard, when the badger had walked many miles from its earth in the oak wood. She was hungry. Leaving her cubs asleep, she crept out of the holt. At the water edge, she listened nearly a minute. Then she turned and climbed the bank, running into the meadow where cows snuffled at her as she stood on her hind legs. 
and swiftly back to the brook by another way through tall balsam plants to the water, where she climbed on a boulder and lay across it, her head near the stream. She clung by her rudder to the reverse side of the stone and whistled for the cubs. Tarka had been peering from the holt, and at the first whistle he moved forward into the water, making hardly a ripple. He swam across the pool with his forelegs tucked under him, kicking with the hind legs only. The toes were spread at the thrust so that two webs drove him forward with one kick. Behind him swam the cubs, the arrowy ripples pushed from their noses, breaking against each other. They followed Tarka across the floating crow's foot flowers and reached their mother, who lay so still. They spoke to her, nuzzling her with their heads and mewing their hunger. The otter caught small fish so quickly in the narrow water that Tarka was soon gorged, and the other cubs, in their quick hunger, were able to snatch a fish from him while he was rolling on his back in order to have the pleasure of clawing it over his head. At dimmit light they went down to the brook again, meeting a fox who was quietly lapping to quench his thirst made by swallowing the fur of so many mice. He looked at the otter. The otter looked at him. The fox went on lapping until the water was spoiled by their musky scent when he went up the hill to sniff in his earth. The otter took her cubs up the brook and over a field. Away from water her movements were uneasy. Often she stopped in her low running to stare with raised head and working nostrils. A galvanized iron chicken coop in a field caused her to make a wide loop. The scent of man was there. A pair of boots, left by a tramp in a hedge, made Tarka tiss with fear, turn about and run away. The cubs were now as active and alert as their mother. At last they reached the ditch remembered by the otter. She leaned down to the brown scummed water, clinging to the bank by her rudder. Bullfrogs had been croaking a moment before she arrived there, but now they were silent and burrowing in the mud. With paw and nose, she sought under the weed, nipping them and dropping them on the grass. The cubs seized them and turned away, yickering. And when she'd caught all she could find, the otter ran back to the cubs and began to flay the frogs, for their skins were tough. They left some of the frogs uneaten and travelled a mile up the brook, which became smaller and narrower. And at the end of the night, it was less than a yard across. They reached a thread of water and followed it downwards until it was joined by another thread. The two made a stream which hastened under whitish banks of clay. The otter sought for fish, but finding none, climbed out of the channel by a slanting otter path and crossed the railway track near a tall, dark chimney that rose out of buildings. It was a brick factory. An otter had travelled before them, and in a hollow behind birch trees about a quarter of a mile on, they heard a whistle. And running towards the call, they came to a deep reed-fringed pond, on the clay side of which a grown dog otter was playing with the wings of a drake. Tarka kept behind his mother, being frightened of the stranger. He had a split ear, done in a fight two years before. Mother and cubs went into the pond, leaving him rolling on the bank and tossing the wings with his paws. Mother and cubs roved about in the water for a while, and the dog joined them. The frogs and eels, having seen them, were in hiding, and so the bitch climbed out through the grey lichened white thorn bushes and ran among rush clumps to the next pit. They hunted through four ponds before they had caught enough to be ready for romping. The fourth pond was larger than the others, and so deep that Tarka had not breath enough to follow the grown otters down in the gloomy water, although he tried many times. He knew they were playing, and mewed to them to come up. Sometimes a string of luminous bubbles shook up and passed him, but that was all he saw of the fun. He could see above him, but all was obscure beneath, although he could sometimes hear them. The old dog otter was happy because he had another otter to play with him. His wander years were past. He had killed salmon in the Severn, eaten pollock on the rocks of Portland Bill, and lampreys in the X. Now he dwelled among the reeds and rushes of the white clay pits. 
The pollen-holding anthers of the reed maces withered and dropped into the water, but still the bitten cubs stayed on the land of ponds. Here Tarka tasted his first pheasant, caught by the bit in the woods where game was preserved. It was a cockbird, and only had one wing, the other having dropped off in the winter after a gunshot wound. The bird was a swift runner, and nearly pecked out the eye of the otter before it died. By day they slept in the reeds. From his couch of bitten and pressed down hollow stems, Tarka watched the dragonflies which flew glittering over the water. Once a cuckoo was flying over with an egg in its beak when a sparrowhawk dashed at the bird and the egg dropped into the water. Splap! Tarka awakened, saw the egg, dived, brought it to the couch and ate it before the shadow of a grass stalk had moved its own width on the bank. Tarka was rolling on his back in the beams of the sun one morning when he heard the distant note of the hunting horn and soon after the tongues of hounds. The bitch listened. And when the baying became louder, she pressed through the reeds with the cubs and took to the bramble undergrowth beyond the north bank of the pond, where the bitch and cubs were safe. For although hounds drew down the brook, finding and carrying their line to a wood, the hunt was stopped by a keeper. Young pheasants were in the wood, and gins were tilled for their enemies. A tawny owl, perching against the trunk of a larch tree, saw the otters coming up the stream, and its eyes, soft with light as the dark blue sloe is soft with bloom, watched them until they crept into a rocky cleft below a fall, where royal ferns cast their great shadows, and water violets were cooled by dripping mosses. At midnight the western sky was pale blue and hollow, like a mussel shell on the seashore. The light lingered on the hill line where trees were dark. Under the summer stars a hundred swifts were screaming as they played away the night two miles above the earth. In fine weather they kept on the wing for many days and nights together, never roosting. Their puny screams were heard by Tarka as he rubbed his neck against the grassy mound of an ant's nest. While he was enjoying the feeling, a loud chackering noise came down from the wood. The otters swung round, four heads pointed towards the trees. The bitch ceased to nibble her fur. The other cubs forgot their play with the head of a corn crake. The noise, distinct in the dewfall, was met by other cries as harsh and angry. When the curious otters reached the wood, other noises were mingled with the chackering. Green points of light glinted in the undergrowth about them, like moonlight in dewdrops, for many vares or weasels were watching a fight of two dogfishes or stoats on the woodland path. Running along the bank of a ditch beside the path, the fitches had met at the mouth of a drain pipe, out of which strayed a hunger-making smell. The pipe, covered with grass sods, lay beside an oak log felled for a path across the ditch. Both ways had been made by the keeper, one for himself and the other for fitches and vares, whose liking for pipes and covered ways he knew. There were many such ways in the wood, and to make them more attractive, the keeper had placed the flesh and entrails of dead rabbits inside the pipes. Each dogfitch was trying to break the other's neck by a bite behind the ear. They rolled and snapped and scratched with their long claws, their black-tipped tails twitching with rage. Every stoat and weasel which heard them ran to watch the fight on the pathway made by the hobnailed boots of the keeper. Tawny and dwarf owls peered down from the branches of oak trees, while from afar a fox listened and prowled on again. A crow awoke in an ivy-thick holly, muttered, Ah! and laid its beak against its neck feathers once more. Tarka circled round the stoats with the other cubs, mewing and yickering with excitement, and then he smelt the rabbit flesh inside the drain pipe. The youngest cub also smelled it. She was quicker than Tarka, and her head and shoulders were inside one end when he ran in at the other. He had bared his teeth to snatch the flesh when there was a hard snap a knock of iron on the pipe, a blow on the side of his head, and a loud whimpering and tissing from the cub. Immediately the bitch was by her, running round outside the pipe in her anguish. She scraped at the sods covering the pipe, blowing and gasping anew, when a retriever started to bark. She ran away, whistling the cubs to follow her, 
but returned to the cry of the cub, which had fallen out of the pipe and was dangling by its rudder. The barking changed to an eager whine when a door of the cottage opened and a man's voice spoke. Sounds came up distinctly from the coom below. While the otter tore with her teeth at the chain, the spring and the closed jaws of the gin, Tarka and the other cub ran among the oak saplings, rustling the buff leaves of an old year and breaking the stalks of seeded bluebells, whose caps dropped round black seeds on the earth.